Now, a caravan of migrants is marching towards the United States for several days now. People from Guatemala are crossing over into Mexico and then are hoping for a possible potential passage into the United States. But Mexico has now beefed up its patrolling along the border and also a fallout of that was witnessed at the Guatemalan-Mexican border. A group of migrants clashed with the Guatemalan and the Mexican police on a border bridge between the two nations. Now, the group broke through a gate at the Guatemala border with Mexico and security forces used rubber bullets against migrants. One Honduran migrant was also killed in the clashes and six police officers were injured. The firefighters said that several Guatemalan police officers and migrants were injured as the group kicked and pushed its way through the gate on the Guatemalan side of the border. The several people received medical treatment for exposure to tear gas that was fired by the police. Hemos trasladado personas eh, con golpe de calor, con insolación, con algunos golpes contundentes y hace rato pues se trasladó a una persona herida en la región frontal, según versión no verídica, dicen que falleció esta persona. And also Mexico's interior secretary has said that the Mexican police and the immigration agents were attacked with rocks, glass bottles and fireworks as the migrants tried to break through a border gate. It insisted that these migrants will be allowed into Mexico only after due process was followed. El gobierno de México rechaza las manifestaciones de violencia ocurridas hoy en la frontera con Guatemala y reitera que la única vía para ingresar a México es mediante el cumplimiento de las leyes migratorias. Grupos de personas intentaron ingresar a territorio nacional por la frontera sur, concretamente en el puente internacional de Ciudad Hidalgo, Chiapas, a Ciudad Tecumumán, Guatemala rompiendo la reja de entrada, en este caso, a nuestro país y agrediendo con piedras, petardos, botellas de vidrio y cuetones a personal de migración y a policía federal desarmada. Now, the unrest has come as a larger group of thousands of Central American migrants took a break on their caravan's long journey through southern Mexico while vowing to pr press ahead towards the United States border. A total of three caravans are now headed north toward a border President Trump is vowing to block. KPXI political reporter Melissa Kane has the latest. For two weeks, thousands of people from Honduras and Guatemala have been making their way to the U.S. They're now in Arriaga, Mexico, about a thousand miles south of the U.S. border. A second caravan of about 2,000 people, mostly Hondurans, is also headed for the U.S. And today, they faced off with police on the Guatemalan border with Mexico. Also today, a group of 300 people from El Salvador set off to make a similar trek to the U.S. I want the people of the caravan to come into our country, but they have to come in legally, like all of the millions of people that are waiting online right now. They can't break into our borders. They're not going to. General James Mattis says officials are drafting an order to send military resources to the U.S.'s border with Mexico. In fact, he says some equipment, things like barriers, are already headed that way. On the border, uh, we are preparing uh, what we call defense support for civilian authorities. Uh, right now, it, it'll be phased. Uh, General Mattis says the military presence would be similar to a disaster relief mission. Homeland Security Secretary Kirsten Nielsen says it's already a disaster on the border. We have a crisis at the border right now. We are stopping between 1,500 and 1,700 people a day trying to cross illegally into this country. According to the Honduran government, a number of people in the first caravan have gone back to Honduras. And to those who remain, Mexico 
recently offered health care, education, work visas and jobs. But most of the migrants rejected that offer. Mexico has offered them asylum. In some cases, they have refused. Mexico has offered them work permits. In some cases, they have refused. And I think what the president and I are both saying, and we want to be clear on this, is if you seek asylum, do so in the first safe country. Mexico has offered you refuge. If you want a job, that is not asylum. If you want to be reunited with your family, that is not asylum. Melissa Kane, KPIX 5. A second migrant caravan from Central America is now headed north. This one formed in El Salvador. About 300 people left the capital, headed for Guatemala. They organized on Facebook, copying the other caravans. Groups are using safety in numbers and trying to avoid human traffickers. The migrants want to reach the United States. It is about 260 miles until they reach southern Mexico. As for the larger caravan, already in Mexico, it has stopped moving north. Organizers are now looking at a possible child abduction in the group. More than 7,000 people are camped out in a Mexican city right now. They're using the downtime to get medical treatment. Mexico is trying to stop the group, encouraging them to apply for refugee status there. And President Trump has said he won't allow them to enter the country illegally. Developing tonight, the caravan of Central American migrants continues to make its way through Mexico with a goal of illegally entering into our country. My next guest oversees 80 miles of border in southeast Arizona. I actually traveled there in the summer of 2017 and saw for myself with him the dire battle to secure our border. Sheriff Mark Donnells joins me now with reaction to this latest immigration crisis facing our country. Uh, all right. Good evening, Sheriff. Good to see you again, by the way. Uh, let's talk about what's going on. When I was there with you, uh, and, and I don't know if they had the two of us on horses. Yeah, there we are. Um, <laughs> you oversee 80 miles of the border uh, over which uh, across which you and I rode for a while. But now it appears that uh, the president is sending even more than the original number of troops he was sending, a thousand more uh, to the border as a result of Secretary Mattis requesting uh, an increase in the number of troops. Their position is that they're going to stop them from entering. How do you do that if you don't have a wall. Well, th that's a challenge. And let me say, I sat in a brief a few days ago over in Yuma, Arizona with Secretary Nielsen and the commissioners from ICE and Border Patrol. And everything's on the table, Judge. Everything's on the table about how do we do this? How do we do this? Yeah. You know, and, and, I'll, and I'll speak in our county, in Cochise County, we've done some amazing work with our federal partners, Governor Ducey, uh, Congresswoman McSally, uh, local law enforcement. We, we've done some amazing things to, to make our county a safer place to live. But I'm telling you, this is bigger than just Cochise County. Yeah. We have a vulnerable county. Uh, and I, vulnerable in the fact that we don't have all the fencing. We don't have all the, the infrastructure. And we don't have all the staffing we need by our federal partners to secure the border. And they come up in this mass anywhere on the southern southwest border, there's going to be a challenge. And that's we're working ways. And we have a president that's stepping up. We have our local law enforcement, state law enforcement, federal working, stepping up. We need congressional leaders to step up and join this fight because securing our borders is a constitutional mandate. It's not discretionary, it's a mandate. Okay, all right, so so you don't have those congressional leaders, and in fact, you have people who in the budget uh, have uh, pretty much precluded the president from actually doing the prototype of the wall for which they put in 1.6 billion in the budget, or maybe it was million, I don't really recall, it was 1.6. But the truth is that there are all kinds of tributaries. You know, we talk about one caravan. In truth, you've got your county, uh, your party, Yuma, you you're part of Tucson, and then you've got Yuma. and But there's a whole border of thousands of miles. There's no way you can prevent them. I don't care how many military, unless they're handing, standing shoulder to shoulder or holding hands, you can't stop these people. Am I wrong? Tell me and, I'm wrong. I, I can't tell you you're wrong, Judge. You know I would if I could, but I can't in this case. Do the fact is we know that. Our federal government knows that. President Trump knows that. And so... Every community, I know in our community, our area, local law enforcement, federal partners, we're coming together to make local plans. If they come to our county, if they come to our um, 
uh, adjacent counties. So we're working our tails off to secure this border from California to Texas. You can't and do it. Sheriff. Mark, Mark, Sheriff, I'm sorry. You can't do it. I saw it. They're going to walk across. And you can have as much night vision and old x-ray and everything else. You can't possibly do it. There are thousands of people. Now, let me ask you a question. Mexico apparently but, said to them, hey, guys, we'll let you stay here uh, uh, and, and we'll, we'll give you uh, asylum here in Mexico. Now, my reading of the reports are they said, gee, no, we'll walk to the United States. Was that a real effort on the part of Mexico or were they just with a wink and a nod saying, say, no, go to the U.S.? Well, well, you got look, look at this is what this is the big picture that worries me is the reason they didn't take refugee. And I was told the same thing, the same intel report you're hearing. I was told this a couple of days ago. The fact that they're not taking that and some did, though, the reason they're not taking that is they're coming here because they know they can walk right in. And they, get they, money and it's housing like and thing. education. And cell phone, and cell phone. And a cell phone, I forgot that. All right. Now, yeah. do you believe, Sheriff, that this is a spontaneous caravan? And although, I'm going to ask you this first, immigrant apprehensions in your county and your neighboring county jumped 50% in this past fiscal year compared to last year. Uh, so uh, I want to ask you, one, why is that? And two, do you think this caravan is spontaneous, kind of like that protest in Benghazi, who was just spontaneous it just happened or was this planned? You, you know, first of all, you're right. We're up 50 percent. This is the worst human smuggling we've seen migration in eight years in Cochise County and along the southwest border. So um, the reason it's happening is the fact that they can. The answer your question, they can do the fact is what's stopping them? What's stopping them? We have a president stepping up and saying, you're not coming in. He's sending a very strong message. When the President Trump was first elected, uh, two years ago, the human and drug smuggling went down to nil on the southwest border. His message was clearly received. Unfortunately, they sat back and watched our congressional folks yep. fight with our president. Yep. And now they're saying, hey, Hey, All they can't right. control their borders. We're coming. All right. We're coming. Sheriff, uh, I, I got to go, but I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to be down there in a couple of weeks. I'm going to join you. Sheriff Mark Donnells, you do a great job. Take Thanks care. so much for being with us. Thank you. Secretary of Defense James Mattis says barriers are now at the southern border and soon there will be troops there too. This comes in response to a caravan of migrants headed to the United States. And as News 4 Tucson's Eric Fink explains, one local immigration lawyer is questioning that move. It's new at 10. The caravan of migrants on their way to the United States stopped Sunday to rest in southern Mexico, just as Defense Secretary James Mattis outlines a plan to send active duty troops to assist Border Patrol and the National Guard to protect our southern border. We are preparing uh, what we call defense support for civilian authorities. Uh, right now it, it'll be phased. Tucson immigration lawyer Mo Goldman questions the Trump administration's tactics. It's not an invasion. The mass majority of them are coming here for a, a reason other than trying to bring harm to the United States. You wonder why we even leave open the question of what more of a benefit they'll provide since we already have National Guard on the border. Mattis says his team is moving barriers to the border just ahead of moving in an additional military presence. And we'll make certain we have whatever material, just like we do for the storm, what, what's the material requirement, how many troops are needed, President Trump claims criminals and Middle Easterners are part of the caravan, although he admits there's no evidence for that. There's no proof of anything. There's no proof of anything, uh, but they could very well be. Goldman argues this is part of President Trump's strategy to rally his base just days before the midterms. Immigration is one of the, the key issues for this election, but it's how you view it. Do you view it as something that we should fear or is it something that we should be embracing? And Goldman says when a majority of these people make it to the border, they will have to follow the legal process and provide a credible basis for asylum. I'm Eric Fink, News 4 Tucson. Migrant caravan marching toward our southern border, ready to defy U.S. immigration Many laws. Many of them are now actually refusing Mexico's offer for asylum. We were told they wanted asylum. Now they're being offered asylum in Mexico, and they're saying no. They're saying no. They want to push forward to the United States. Well, Griff Jenkins is live with the caravan in southern Mexico. Griff? 
Good morning, guys. We're in Tapanetapec, and the migrants are staying strong here. They're wanting to defy U.S. laws and make it there, and they're not accepting President uh, Pena Nieto's offer of uh, asylum here to get temporary work, health care, and uh, some education uh, benefits. But look here in, in Tapanetapec, you can see they're starting to wake up the migrants. Now, the group leading this, Pueblo Sin Fronteras, is going to have a press conference today at 10 a.m., and that's really got us very interested. But interested because are they trying to give the migrants a day of rest or are they going to make some sort of announcement? They've said they're actually going to try and get to Mexico City. You can see folks here starting to gather. The group telling us they want to actually get moving because in the early morning they can move and it's not as harsh on them, but conditions are wearing on the group here. We were told in this area at about 11 o'clock there was a pretty vicious fight over food. Now we have talked to a few people and Jose is from Honduras. He was deported earlier this year. He was convicted of a felony, attempted homicide, but he says he wants to get back to the U.S. I want to ask you, Jose, buenos dias. Yeah, buenos dias. Why are you trying to go back to the U.S.? Uh, American city. I want to go into Bob because and uh, yeah, I got it my wife, I got it my daughter too right there too. I want to uh, live in together over there. But but I I want to I want to because I got a, a trouble in a, in a gang 18 in a, my country Honduras. I got a lot of trouble. And earlier this year, deported for felony? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Deport. Uh, uh, so if necessary, are you willing to break the law to get back to the United States? Si es necesario, necesario uh, dispuesto uh, 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 violar la ley para entrar a Estados Unidos. Pues yo quiero entrar y pedir un perdón, un perdón. Uh, he says he wants to apply for pardon for the felony he committed. Gotcha. And uh, Lucina is going to help us a little. Lucina, what was the crime that he committed? Uh, he was convicted of related to murder. Convicted of murder. Okay. And uh, not not convicted. No. He, okay. Can you ask him exactly what happened? Um, ¿cuál, ¿Cuál es tu felonía exactamente? Number three. A third degree felony? Intento de, de matar. Attempt of murder. And do, do you believe, does he think, uh, uh, Pinces, uh, will, will he be successful in trying to get there? Um, está preguntando si, si vas a tener éxito, en, si crees que vas a tener éxito en, que te, en entrar y en que te perdonen. Pues pienso eso, pienso lo mejor para mi vida y quiero borrar todo ese problema que pagar un abogado en Estados Unidos y luego este eh, quedar limpio en Estados Unidos porque llevo otra mentalidad de trabajar como, tal como es y servir a Estados Unidos. Quiero vivir en Estados Unidos, no quiero vivir en otro país. Yeah, he's going to try to pay a, a lawyer to get him clean and he just want, wants to work and have a clean work record. Which is because it's... So that's the situation here as we're talking to the people and he's trying to get back to his family. He actually was telling us earlier he lives in the Washington, D.C. area. But as you can see, this group is wanting to move and we're waiting to find out this new development that the group says that they're not going to start walking today. We'll stay here, guys, as things develop. Griff. Back to you. Uh, Fascinating stuff, Griff. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, amazing. Sorry. I mean, uh, convicted of a felony, attempted murder. His wife and kids are back in the United States. He's been deported once, willing to cross illegally. Wow, that underscores. Right. I, I don't know that he was convicted. I thought he was charged, but uh, we don't know all the details, obviously, is the point. No. And here he is charged with a third degree felony saying, I want to get back to America to clear up my record. This man was charged with attempted murder. But if you're a deported felon... He's saying himself. Yeah, I mean, it's... it's we don't know. Either. Again, it's one interview yeah. on the border, but... Well, I mean, there's no reason for that guy to lie. I mean, he, that, that's clearly... This is his story, <laughs> this yeah. This is his story. I mean, if he was going to lie, he might have taken out the murder that, part of the story. Doesn't that make the point, like, maybe we don't want folks who are felons coming back into the country? From Central America is setting out in a caravan in hopes strength in numbers will help them reach the United States. About 300 Salvadorans left today. The group was, was must travel, make that about 75 miles to reach the border with Guatemala and another 185 miles to reach Mexico's southernmost border. Thousands continue their trek to the U.S. despite threats from President Trump that he's sending troops 
to the Mexico border. I want to get your take on the caravan. Uh, they have taken a break right now, have gotten off of the bus, but are continuing their goal to come to the U.S. southern border at the, in the United States. And the president continues to say, look, now is the time to get back in and turn around because you will not be let into this country. As the congressman from a border state of Texas, your thoughts on how to deal with this caravan and now another caravan? Well, as a nation of immigrants, we want to be as generous and uh, compassionate as possible, and we are. Uh, we let a million immigrants into this country legally every year. That's more than any other uh, country in the world. Um, but uh, to ignore a horde of uh, uh, folks that, from unknown origins with unknown intents, uh, intentions other than to come into this country illegally, uh, is just plain reckless. I mean, the role of the federal government, while we have one, Maria, um, is in part to provide for the common defense, and that means securing the sovereignty and integrity of our territorial borders. Now, presidents have paid uh, lip service to that in the past. It's nice, and I think, uh, you know, President Trump deserves credit for demonstrating that he really intends uh, to enforce our borders and to enforce uh, the rule of law. So I commend him for that, yeah. and I support him. I mean, the, the issue is, that w once they do get here, there's catch and release. So they can come in and then get a court date to come back, and oftentimes they don't come back. So then they're just here illegally. Yeah, you, you asked about the impact, Maria. I mean, it, it's profound in, in any number of ways, particularly to constituents of mine in, in Texas, where a lot of these folks uh, will come through. Um, you know, there's an economic cost, the burden on our health care system, on our hospitals, on our schools. That's profound. But there's often a, a far more personal impact. Um, you know, I have uh, a family of constituents uh, that lost three members uh, to an illegal alien that had previously been deported. Uh, Kate Steinle's in San Francisco, Molly Tibbetts in Iowa. Unfortunately, almost every week we see an example that um, uh, in this population of people that would come here, um, are, are folks that have a history of uh, gun, gang, drug, and uh, violent crime uh, histories that sometimes have a profound impact uh, in a pers personal way on Americans. Yeah, it's, it's really important for you to assess the impact because, you know, oftentimes people will say, look, America is, is a country of immigrants, and, and we are. And as you say, that is why uh, it, uh, that we uh, let in legally uh, the number of people that we do. But there is an economic cost to this. And when you do have others coming in and taking the jobs and taking the resources of the people that have already been here, our American citizens, have in in many cases gone through the the structure to get in legally you're taking those resources away from them the president uh, was at a rally last night in illinois he discussed border security in the caravan as part of his campaign listen to this and you know the military is going to the border you do and i want the people of the caravan to come into our country but they have to come in legally like They can't break into our borders. They're not going to. You're going to see, we called in the military. The military, oh, they're ready, they're ready. And I wish I could just tell them, and I say it, caravan, turn around. You're not coming in. You're not coming in. So, so Congressman, tell us the role of the military. The, the president has sent military troops there. What specifically will the military be doing? Well, they'll support law enforcement. Uh, you know, this is not a deal where the troops go there uh, for a military confrontation. Uh, they're not authorized to do that. They have to have uh, authorization from Congress before they could engage in that. Uh, what the president is talking about is sending troops in support of our law enforcement to uh, support our immigration laws um, uh, at the border. So it, it'll be a it'll be a supporting role. But I think you know that clip. Uh, it again, demonstrates that the president is, is sending a message, obviously, uh, to the folks in the caravan that would come to this country illegally, but, but I think maybe just as importantly, sending a message to the Central American governments that in some cases um, are encouraging this and have been encouraging this. Um, so, you know, very clearly, I think this is one of the reasons that candidate Trump became President Trump, because he promised 
um, to secure our borders, and he's making good on that promise. Yes. And I support him. Meanwhile, President Trump is already taking steps to stop the caravan from ever reaching American soil. Reporter Nicole Killian has more details from the White House. President Trump is considering taking executive action to stop people in the caravan of migrants from entering the U.S., even through legal means. The order, if enacted, would prevent the migrants from seeking asylum at the border. Everything is on the table. Uh, we are working through that and discussing uh, what that would mean in terms of implications operationally uh, and, of course, what would work the best. The president has already sent a word of warning to thousands of people making their way to the U.S. border from Central America, tweeting at them to turn around, saying, We are not letting people into the United States illegally. It will not happen. You watch. It won't happen. We can't let it happen. The president has used the caravan to make immigration a top campaign issue in the upcoming midterm elections, even though the migrants are still more than a thousand miles away. The Trump administration is planning to send hundreds of active duty troops to the border to help strengthen security. The order from Defense Secretary James Mattis will deploy the new troops, joining the roughly 2,000 National Guardsmen the president dispatched in April. The soldiers will assist the Border Patrol building barriers and looking for people crossing illegally. But they do not have the authority to arrest illegal immigrants, and they won't be authorized to use force except in self-defense. Democrats say focusing on the border is the wrong approach. If we could stop the flow of drugs, if we could curtail the level of violence in Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, you would not have these migrants uh, streaming forward trying to get into our country. It's unknown how many people in the caravan will make it to the border. Thousands have already abandoned the attempt. Secretary of Defense James Mattis approving a Department of Homeland Security request to deploy at least 800 troops to the U.S. southern border. They are expected to support the roughly 2,000 National Guard troops already there. This, as a migrant caravan heading for the U.S., rejects a proposal from Mexico to apply for refugee status in that country. John, the migrants continue to march north. We are in San Pedro Tepanitepec. You can see the town square taking over. This is where the majority of the migrants have ended up. In fact, let us show you around here at this square. You see they're tired. They've had a long march. They're more than 200 miles north of the Guatemala-Mexico border, and they're camping out here for the night. Some aid organizations giving water. Uh, food, clothing as they can. But the day began with a standoff with the Mexican police. Now, where we are in San Pedro Tapanetepec is in the Oaxaca state, and that's where they wanted to get to. But when they were in Chiapas, the more southern state, there was disagreement between the two states, and they wanted these migrants to listen to President Peña Nieto's offer of temporary work, some health care, perhaps some immigration status. But the migrants chose not to do that, so they clearly got through the police standoff and are in this area. Now, where they will head next is to a further city, uh, Huchitan, in Oaxaca by tomorrow. But ultimately, they want to get by next Friday to Mexico City. Pueblo Sin Fronteras, the group leading this, is wanting to make a political statement in Mexico City with not just President Peña uh, Nieto, but also with the incoming president, Obrador, because they believe they have a right to get continue their march for asylum to the United States. But as you can see, it's very treacherous. They've been at this since October 13th, but their will not seemingly to be broken. When we ask them here, many of them from Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, when we hear that the president says they're not going to be allowed to cross, they said they hope the president has mercy. They're going to continue. In San Pedro, Tabanepetec, I'm Griff Jenkins. Fox News. The Secretary of Homeland Security visited the finished border wall project in Calexico. And during yesterday's visit, Secretary Nielsen said 11 more miles of border barrier work is planned for next year. One of the concerns tied to the border is the approaching migrant caravan. She confirms the military may get involved to help in border security, but didn't give troop numbers or when they would be sent to the border. And 
Okay, Amazon in a new controversy. It's over its facial recognition software. Today, the ACLU filing a Freedom of Information Act request with Homeland Security and ICE. They want to see any documents about ICE's use of facial recognition software for following these reports that Amazon tried to sell its, quote, recognition software, that's a brand name, to help catch illegals. Let's bring in Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. What's your reaction to this? Well, you know, this is an odd area of jurisprudence because the Supreme Court has ruled that where there is an expectation of privacy, the government has to respect it. So is there an expectation of privacy in your face on a public street? Answer, no. Even though our faces are unique to us and we don't like somebody taking a picture of us against our will or right in our face, the government can do this. Now, I can give you a lot of reasons why they shouldn't be using... Can they do it to an illegal immigrant? Yes. I can give you a lot of reasons why they should not be using facial recognition software, but the Constitution is not one of them. The same Supreme Court opinion that says the government can take a picture of your face says you can hide your face, you can wear a mask. It's impractical. Can the Consti to wear a Does mask. the Constitution, can you use the Constitution to say you're not allowed to use my image? No, as long as your image was taken in a public place. Got if it. the government okay. takes an image of you in your bedroom, they have violated your Fourth Amendment rights and other rights. If the government takes an image of you on the street, they can use it. But do we really want to live in a society where the government monitors us by using pictures of our yeah. face? This this is beyond anything Orwell imagined in yeah. 1984 or the Stasi well, did the in East Germany. And the ACLU is way up in arms about this. There's all lawsuits all, and, of, all over and this. there was no public debate. And watch this, Judge. The, you know, the, uh, you know, here's what happened. The ACLU tester of Amazon software, you saw this, and basically found that, you know, 28 congressmen were matched wrongfully to criminal mugshots. I mean, I'm telling you, this is it, faulty software, it, it, if, that's, it, it, if that's correct. It is faulty software, and it's dangerous, because human freedom, whether you can cross this border and make an application for asylum, is being determined by software that doesn't work, is draconian, has never been used And it's before. also about the chain of custody, right? Who's right. got that software right. and that image? Right. I mean, it could have been doctored. A new at five, a report from the Government Accountability Office takes a look at what happened during the zero tolerance policy on immigration at our southern border. The government mandate brought national attention to the valley this past summer. Channel 5's Valerie Gonzalez reports. The mandate separated migrant children and adults at the border in June. The GEO report reviewing its effects was released today. It shows Department of Homeland Security and HHS did not know about the zero tolerance policy until the day it was announced. This meant they did not plan or prepare for the increased number of immigrants they'd be processing. The report details that several shelters and staffers were never told that a child had been separated from a parent. That led to many children being mistakenly deemed unaccompanied minors. As such, it took longer to reunite them with family. The policies for unaccompanied minors defines them as lacking guardians or parents to whom they could be released. Once they were separated, tracking children and parents was complicated due to databases that were not updated by HHS or Homeland Security. The zero tolerance policy was put on hold after public outcry in June. In the studio, Valerie Gonzalez, Channel 5 News at 5. Back in this country, more than 700,000 immigrants have applied to become U.S. citizens. But under President Trump's administration, it could take longer for those applications to get the green light. ABC4's Rosie Wynn joins us in the studio to explain why. Rosie? Well, Andrew, according to reports, this is a process that has jumped from six months to two years for some immigrants. Citizenship officials say that's because of a surge in applications. And people waiting on their application right now tell me they don't have time to wait that long. Citizenship is something Daniel DeLeo and his kids never had to worry about because they were born in the United States. But for his wife, Lisa, that's a different story. It makes you cry every day. <laughs> um, I say that laughing now, but I mean, I've shed tons of tears. She immigrated to the United States back in 2001 and has been fighting for citizenship ever since. Last month, she finally became a U.S. citizen after what she calls an emotional journey. It was a huge burden lifted off my shoulders and I didn't feel like 
anybody could take that away from me. That's why she says it's devastating that now some immigrants may have to wait even longer to get to that point because some don't have time to wait. If their visa or green card expires before citizenship is granted, they could be sent back to their native country. Ku Wei Li is in that boat. She applied for citizenship at the beginning of the year and can only wait. It's frustrating because meanwhile there's so many things going on and then uh, extend to two years. That makes me like make my life kind of have to pause on certain, certain, certain things. DeLeo says even if chances seem slim, don't give up. To keep going and just do the right thing no matter what because it doesn't matter how long it takes you. I mean, it, could have, it took me 17 years. Immigrant advocates say they believe the application process is being prolonged to keep anti-Trump supporters from voting. Officials say what's causing the delay is an 8% increase in applications, but nonetheless, they insist their agency is operating efficiently and effectively. Andrew, back to you. Welcome back to Upfront. The race to replace House Speaker Paul Ryan is being closely watched by political observers here and around the country. The major party candidates in the 1st Congressional District are Democrat Randy Bryce, a Racine Ironworker, and Republican Brian Stile, a former Ryan aide, UW Regent, and attorney for a manufacturing company. We talked to Randy Bryce earlier this month, and today we are joined by the Republican Brian Stile of Janesville. It's good to have you back on the program. Thanks for having me, Mike. We'll try and cover as many uh, big issues as we can today, and I want to begin with one that the president is talking a lot about. That's immigration. He thinks there's a crisis at the border. He's concerned about a caravan heading north. Uh, he's talking about military troops down along the border, closing it down entirely to migrants. What do you think? Are we at a moment of crisis? Our immigration system's broken. I think we've been let down by Democrats and Republicans alike. I think we need to step one, secure the border. I think a wall is a component to that. Two, we need to have a discussion on our legal immigration system. In particular, I think our legal immigration system should take account for our workforce needs here in Wisconsin. So a pathway to citizenship for those people who are already in this country, may have come here illegally, but they're here. What do we do about that? I think in particular, you look at the DACA individuals, individuals who are brought here through no fault of their own. I think there's an opportunity uh, after we've secured the border in step one uh, to allow those individuals to come right with the law. Uh, but I think step one is we need to secure the border uh, for multiple reasons. I talked to members of the law enforcement community in Kenosha the other day, and we talk about uh, some of the drug trafficking, in particular heroin, uh, that they view as crossing that southern border. I think there's multiple reasons that it's appropriate uh, to secure our border. This is a big one. In the last week, a group of Cambodian, Cambodian activists formed an anti-deportation advocacy group of Washington, and that has been led by families affected by ICE seizures. We've seen this impact Latino families, and we often hear from those activists, but we don't hear much from Asian communities also being affected. So today I'm joined by Jane Chan, whose family might be impacted by deportation soon. And also we have Sina Sam here with the uh, Washington State, I'm going to get it right, Washington State Commission on Asian Pacific American Affairs. So thank you so much for being here. Thank really you. Really appreciate, it. appreciate mm -hmm. it. Why don't people know enough about what's happening in, um, in Asian communities, specifically communities? Mm -hmm. I would say for the Southeast Asian community, uh, Cambodian Americans in particular, where our narrative as newer immigrants um, in the landscape of immigration is not well known because the Latinx community has the face of deportation. And with our community, we're actually very heavily impacted, such as Jane's family. And in Washington state, we have seven families right now who are in danger of being deported next month. And so the urgency and the crisis is very real for our community as it is for other communities, um, immigration. Jane, I'm so sorry that this is happening to your family. Can you give us uh, a little bit of background of what's happening? Yeah, um, just about two years ago, I've lost my dad due to being detained. Um, last year, he was officially sent out. So that was really hard. Being so far away from each other, it was already hard enough to fight with, you know, to fight for him to stay here. And then now that I have an uncle that's in the process of being deported now, it's my chance to do everything I can here that I couldn't do for my dad. And it's just heartbreaking because he's like the glue the main puzzle piece to keep our family together and it's not the same without them. I'm sure some people at home might say, well, how did they get here to begin with? 
and they came as refugees. Well, Southeast Asian Americans include Cambodians, Vietnamese, Laotians, Hmong, Mian mm -hmm. and Khmu communities. We're the largest migration in U.S. history of refugees coming in after the Vietnam War. And so our newer ar arrival had a lot of struggles in um, us assimilating to the culture, assimilating to the culture. And mm -hmm. right now our communities are just healing and building from that war and genocide um, history. And now we have this new crisis of being torn apart again. Um, but the younger generations, like Jane's family, where she's a U.S. citizen child, she's an American, and now going through separation, that our communities coming from war and genocide during the Vietnam War is uh, re-traumatizing. Um, my parents escaped the war. Jane's parents escaped the war. Our elders are going through post-traumatic stress, and they're still, they're still healing, and right now, this is re-traumatizing all of us and we're all in crisis mode and so it's so important for our story to be in the landscape of immigration deportation issues um, along with the other immigrant groups who are facing it as well during this time. It's so interesting that you say you know the the post-traumatic stress because I had a really good friend in high school who is Cambodian mm -hmm. and his I mean that's just one generation removed mm -hmm. you know so it's still very fresh mm -hmm. in a lot of families. Mm -hmm. um, what can be done? What should people do to, you know, get off the couch and, and to, to help? Um, the first thing for families in particular to do, because there is um, a, a, a climate and an environment of fear right now, and families are very afraid to come forward, and so it was very courageous for Jane to speak today and come out publicly. Um, that's something that uh, Washington families have not done since we um, have been organizing the last decade. So this is in some ways momentous um, in being able to share our story and getting getting it out there. We need families to be able to come forward and seek assistance. Right now the governor um, is able to issue pardons. Um, there is an uh, initiative in California, in Washington, in New York to push for governor pardons. and. Um, in particular for uh, groups who have prior convictions, um, such as our community, it's the only thing that can absolve or save them from deportation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are you, what are you, how is, how are you doing? How's your family doing? When, what is your next step? Um, our next step pretty much is to continue on fighting, you know, can't give up. We got to do as much as we can to keep them staying. Uh, it's just tearing us up. Like we're still heartbroken. I'm still heartbroken having to go through it twice. So families, um, there are resources, there are legal aids and advocacy groups coming together, not just locally with our newly formed Khmer Anti-Deportation um, Advocacy Group, um, but also there is a national network that is coming together to provide legal aid. And that's the most important piece that families need and need to know that there are um, lawyers coming together. Immigration lawyers are very hard to find who know how to advocate for our communities. Um, we're a very unique refugee um, community who's impacted in the whole, you know, um, being uh, swept up in ice raids and things like that. And so um, for immigration lawyers, they are coming together to provide help for families. And families need to know that they're safe when they do come forward in this climate because in the past they have been targeted and detained when they do come forward. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, very emotional <laughs> and my heart goes out to you. I'm wishing the very best. And anything that we can do to educate the public on all of these issues are it's just it breaks my heart. So anything that we can do, please keep us posted on what's going on with you as well. I do want to mention we have a keyword. You can text the word LEARN to 206-448-4545 and we'll also introduce you to another person uh, we've had on the show before. He is the most famous undocumented immigrant uh, citizen in the country. So uh, if you would like to know what it's like to be Asian and undocumented, I encourage you to text the word LEARN right now and we will send you back that link. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. These poetic lines, engraved on a bronze plaque beneath the Statue of Liberty, speak to who we are, a nation of immigrants, until now. As Senate Democrat Chuck Schumer lamented, tears are running down the cheeks of the Statue of Liberty. We've turned our backs on those huddled masses, closed our borders, separated families, hardened our hearts. 
Or so you would think if you only read the headlines or watch TV news. Just one problem. It's not true. The United States still maintains the most generous immigration policies in the world. Generous to a fault. Because the overwhelming numbers have stymied our ability to assimilate the huddled masses. 50 million residents of America are foreign-born. In fact, today the United States has more immigrants as a percentage of its total population than at any time since 1890. That's why, to give one illustration, 176 different languages are spoken among students in the New York City school system. How did we get here? For starters, America grants permanent residence to a million people every single year. And that's just the tip of the iceberg because of something you've probably heard referred to as chain migration. Chain migration allows immigrants to sponsor not only their immediate family, parents, spouses, and children under age 21, but much of their extended family once they gain citizenship, unmarried adult children and any children they might have, married adult children and their children, and brothers and sisters and their children. Princeton University researchers, using the most recently available data, found that immigrants sponsored an average of 3.45 additional relatives each. So the 1 million immigrants granted permanent residence each year potentially adds, over time, another 3.5 million. In addition, an estimated 100,000 refugees and asylum seekers, people who claim to be fleeing political or personal strife abroad, enter the country annually. From 2008 to 2017, the U.S. gave green cards to well over a million people for humanitarian reasons, allowing them to live and work here permanently. After five years, they can apply for full citizenship. We're not done yet. In that same time frame, nearly half a million more people came to America through the Diversity Visa Lottery, a program designed to admit more people from underrepresented countries into the U.S. Diversity visa applicants don't need a high school education, job skills, or pretty much anything. And thanks again to chain migration, spouses and unmarried children under 21 of visa lottery winners also get to come to America. This nonstop flow of new legal immigrants, based on family ties instead of skills, abilities, and allegiance to American values, has of course been supplemented by millions who enter the country illegally and stay illegally. Dominant media outlets use the euphemism undocumented, but the official U.S. government term, used in federal statutes, is illegal alien, an unlawful entrant who came without permission and stays in open defiance of our laws. The number of illegal aliens in the country is usually given as 11 million. But have you noticed that number never seems to change? Common sense suggests it's higher, much higher. And though illegal aliens themselves don't qualify for welfare, they receive free health care in our clinics and hospitals. And through their American-born children, they can expect to receive all manner of benefits, cash aid, food stamps, and housing vouchers. Their children are entitled to a free education in public schools. Building a high-tech border barrier would certainly help stem this flow. Ending chain migration is another obvious remedy. E-Verify, the national database that allows employers to check workers' immigration status, is also essential. So is a fully functioning entry-exit system to track visa overstayers. But all solutions will ultimately fail unless we get control of the numbers and enforce our laws consistently. It's Sovereignty 101. This is our home, and we have not only the right, but the responsibility to determine who comes in, how many come in, and what qualities and qualifications they bring. The truth is, we let in millions, and of course, millions more want to come. Who can blame them? But it's simply not possible or desirable to let in everyone. And it's not hateful to say so. It's not hateful to protect our borders. It's not hateful to protect our citizens. It's not hateful to protect our values. Lady Liberty may be shedding tears, not because we've stopped welcoming immigrants, but because our ill-conceived immigration policies are threatening the American dream. I'm Michelle Malkin, CRTV host and author of Invasion and Sold Out for Prager University.